Thanks, Trudy. Uh, friends, it'd be great if you keep your Bibles open to that part of God's Word. And uh, also there's an outline in your service sheet if you're the sort of person that likes to take notes or uh, throughout. Uh, before I ever became a minister, I was just like many of you. I was a parishioner of my, at my local Anglican church. It was St Paul's Carlingford as my local Anglican church. That was the church where I first really heard the Gospel. Uh, it was back in 1979 where I learned that despite my respectable upbringing in a good family and after my many years of being a great boy scout, that I learned that I was sinful, I was a sinful rebel against God and that I needed forgiveness and salvation. So it was actually at St Paul's Carlingford where I heard the gospel and I became a Christian. But it was also the place where I witnessed the ministry of the church. Uh, even as a distracted teenager, I felt the unsettling force of God's word as though it was speaking to me. It was also where I started to get involved in the ministry at St Paul's. Uh, without any real training, I helped out teaching the Bible with our junior youth group on a Sunday morning. And then I used to go to evening church. Uh, on Sundays as well. After some years, I then became the leader of the senior youth group at St Paul's. They had about 60 to 70 youth and we had about eight leaders. And again, I did that with very little training. Uh, one year, I was elected to the parish council uh, where I made a, a small contribution as the very junior member of that council with the decision for that church to expand its facilities. I also went on to lead a small home group uh, of my peers and some people older than me. And, uh, and then in what was considered the non-ratings period, okay, most churches think that uh, January is the non-ratings period for churches and, uh, and that's where me and a couple of other guys were given the opportunity to preach once to the evening congregation. So it was really at St Paul's Carling that I thought the ministry, I thought it was great. Uh, as I watched the ministers do their thing, I saw them make a real difference in the life of people and I watched the church grow. And it was there that I thought that what was happening here at St Paul's Carlingford, this needs to happen elsewhere. That's how, mu that's how much I valued it. And that's what actually gave me the initial thought to train for full-time vocational ministry. So after a number of years, I decided to finish up as an electrician and have a crack at more theological college to train for the ministry. But I want to say to you this morning that as I went into more theological college, I think I had a very idealised view of Christian ministry that was really just based on my selected experience of it. And I, I think for everybody here this morning that you too will have a certain understanding or a certain expectation of the ministry of the church that is really just based on your selected experience of it. Now, over our third term, we're going to look at the sort of instruction and the advice that the Apostle Paul gives to this young minister by the name of Timothy as he ministers in the church at Ephesus. But before we actually get to 1 Timothy, I thought it would be really good for us to look at, to listen to Paul's advice to the elders of that church in Ephesus. You see, the passage that we've just had referenced, this is the last time that the elders of the church in Ephesus would ever see Paul face to face. And it's a very moving speech as Paul instructs these elders as they fear, face what might feel like uncertain future without Paul's direction and without Paul's guidance. So what does Paul have to say about the ministry uh, of the church? And, and how should his teaching shape our expectations of the ministry that we experience here at St Luke's? Well, the first point that Paul makes is that the ministry that he did is one that serves the Lord. Have a look at verses 17 to 19 of our passage today. Paul says, oh, well, it says, From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, 
You know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. See, as Paul reflects on the ministry he had in Ephesus, he doesn't say that he was there to serve the church. Uh, he says that he was there to serve the Lord with great humility. Now, I actually think it's worth pausing and to seeing what Paul is actually saying here because the word served is the word that describes the sort of service that is offered from a slave to his master. Okay? Paul is talking about his ministry in terms of, in the categories of slavery towards Jesus as his Lord. In fact, Paul viewed his whole life as at the disposal of the Lord to do the Lord's will. Now, I would think that that sort of idea doesn't sit very easily in our culture today, which is very wary of fanaticism. Doesn't it sound a bit over the top for Paul to be using the language of slavery to describe his service of the Lord? I mean, isn't that sort of zealotry questioned by the cultural elites of today? In fact, it may even sit uneasily with some of you here this morning. Slavery. Is that what he's talking about when it comes to talking about serving the Lord? Now, of course, you might dismiss it as, you know, oh, Paul's obviously using exaggeration here to try and uh, make his point, until you realise that in this passage, Paul is offering himself as an example for the elders of the church to follow so that the church might then follow the example of the elders. I mean, that is why Paul says here in verse 18, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. And time and time again throughout this passage, Paul recalls the things that he said and the things that he did as a model for the ministry going into the future. And then in verses 20 to 21, Paul actually describes this service this, uh, of the Lord. Have a look at those verses with me, 20 to 21. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. See, Paul's service of the Lord is, uh, is focused on gospel proclamation, isn't it? both publicly and privately. This is the very heart of his service, his ministry, a ministry that preaches and teaches the word, a ministry that is calling on people to turn to God in repentance and to put their faith in the Lord Jesus. And it's this service of the Lord that the Apostle Paul models is one that doesn't shrink back. It's not the sort of service that takes a backward step when things get hard. In verse 20, it says, it says, you know, I have not hesitated. I have not stepped back for one minute. And then in verse 22, as, as Paul's facing an uncertain future, he says, and now compelled by the Spirit. See, Paul is so utterly committed to this ministry that serves the Lord that it supersedes any self-interest that he might have. I mean, look at the way, what he says there in verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Is that a breathtaking commitment? Breathtaking service. This week I read, uh, I saw this same sort of attitude. It was evident in an uh, English missionary. His name was James Calvert. And he was a Methodist missionary to Fiji. He went to Fiji in a time when there were no resorts. Okay, He went there when cannibalism 
was still practiced on the islands of Fiji. And as the ship, the sailing ship arrived at Fiji, the captain of that ship begged James Calvert not to go ashore, saying to him, you will lose your life and the lives of those with you among those savages. You know what James Calvert said to the ship's captain? We died before we came. That his life was not his own. It was already given up to Jesus. That this task was worth, worth more than his life. And so together with his heroic wife, we ought not to forget his wife, Mary Calvert and John Hunt, for 18 years, those three people witnessed to the Fijian people and eventually saw Fiji's king converted. It's amazing service, isn't it? Now, you know, Paul... The Apostle Paul, he does have a particular ministry as an, as an Apostle of Christ that's not ours. I mean, none of us here are Apostles, okay? Paul did have a particular ministry that's not ours. But his ministry as an Apostle is actually given to us as an example of what is needed for the church without his personal presence amongst us. And I think what Paul says here about serving the Lord and not shrinking back is important for each and every single Christian person who counts themselves as a member of St Luke's Liverpool. So what does that mean for me, serving the Lord? I mean, I'm a paid staff member of St Luke's. How am I supposed to think about this then? Well, I think the application for me is that I am not to see myself as an employee. Uh, I ought not to get preoccupied with my salary that it ought to reflect my time, my effort, my ability or my seniority. Because the moment that I do, the moment that I start thinking about me, myself in terms of being an employee, I will shortchange the Lord. I will shortchange the Lord of whom I am supposed to serve in the same way the Apostle Paul serves. But what will it mean for you as members of St Luke's? Well, I want to say to you that you are not to think of yourself as volunteers. You are not volunteers. As you engage in ministry here at St Luke's, or when you hear about different opportunities to serve the cause of the gospel here at St Luke's, you must not think of yourself in terms of being a volunteer, because if you do, you will shortchange the Lord in whom you've been called to serve. You know, no slave ever volunteered. If, you, if we think of ourselves first primarily as volunteers in, in the service that we offer, then we'll be very little, there will be li very little difference between us and the local soccer club. We are different. I think the key here is that we, we are all called to serve the Lord in ways that are sacrificial, okay? They cost us in some way, and yet they are to be sustainable as well. If any person only volunteers to do what they can do easily, they'll never do anything that's worth doing. So that's the first point. Ministry serves the Lord. Second point that Paul makes in our passage is that the ministry values God's people. Uh, you see, as Paul begins to tell the elders what they need to do in verse 28 uh, that, of this value that uh, uh, they are to have towards God's people, look at verse 28 with me. It says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he has bought with his own blood. Now here at this point, Paul likens the elders of the churches to be like watchmen. Now we don't have watchmen anymore, uh, but in the old days, you know, if you had a city, you had a watchman who stood on the city walls to watch for any approaching threat that might come for the people in the city. And the watchman's duty was to sound the alarm. 
okay? He was to ring the bell, clang the cymbal, whatever he had to do. But he, it was his job to warn the people and it was the people's responsibility to listen to the warning of the watchman. That was their responsibility. And here we're told that the elders, in terms of being watchmen, the first thing that they could watch over is themselves. That they've got to be on guard against the perils of their own heart. That no elder of the church should ever assume that they have risen above some particular sin or have attained a sort of immunity from the temptations that every believer faces. We need to watch our own hearts that we do not deceive ourselves. And then we're told that they're to keep watch over the flock, much like a shepherd keeps watch over his flock. Isn't it interesting that of all the animals that Paul could have used as a metaphor to describe God's people, what does Paul use? A flock of sheep. I mean, he could... I mean, why not a pride of lions? Why couldn't he describe... I mean, you know, that would have been a bit better, wouldn't it? We're at a pride of lions, okay? Or he could have described it as like a grand parade of elephants, you know? But instead... It's a flock of grass-eating sheep. Not the brightest of living creatures in the animal kingdom, but they are great for wool and they are great for a barbecue. (laughs) And that's about it. And yet, this is the metaphor used to describe those that the elders are to shepherd. So why are they valued? If they're just sheep... Why why are they valued? Well, it's not because of what they do. They're valued because they belong to God and they've been purchased at great expense. You see it there in verse 28, don't you? It says, be shepherds of the church of God. That your value is not because you're members of St Luke's Liverpool, nor you're not members of my church as though this is my church. No, no. You are valued because you are members of the church of God. And the reason that you belong to God is because you were bought with God's own blood. When the Son of God laid down his life for us on the cross. You know, our salvation that comes to us, our salvation is free, but it was never cheap. You are the church of God and you are treasured by God. Which raises the question, how do we value the different congregations that meet here at St Luke's? I mean, if they too are valued by God, and if they too have been purchased by uh, by his blood, how do you think about the other congregations, the 8.30 congregation, the the Nepalese congregation, or our 6pm congregation? How do you think about those churches? Do do you just ignore them? Uh, Do you tolerate them? Uh, Do you pray for them? Do you serve them? Questions that I think are worth turning over in our minds in terms of if we really believe that our churches are valued by God, well, how do we value them personally? Now, the elder, of course, has a particular responsibility to this valued flock that ought to shape our expectations of ministry. As Paul instructs these elders, we're to look at this and say, okay, what is... What are we to expect of the elders in our churches? We'll have a look at verses 29 to 31. Paul says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even though, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each, each of you night and day with tears. See, here Paul warns against the, an internal threat and an external threat to this vulnerable flock. This threat is described as savage wolves. And what he's talking about here are those people who will claim to have a sort of a religious insight and sort of understanding. They'll be people who are very persuasive, but they will be deceptive at the same time. What they will be doing is that they will be coming to the church and they'll be offering a new plausible perspective on the plain meaning of scripture. Have you thought about reading it this way? Okay? 
and they will distort the very word of God that will tear the flock apart. Now, as I was preparing this sermon this week, I think there are three threats that are at least facing uh, churches in Western countries. I can't speak of other countries, but I can at least think there are three threats that are presently facing us in terms of false teaching. First, the first one is the sort of Bible teaching in churches that mimics much of the sort of modern self-help industry. The sort of Bible teaching that panders to your desire for you to be all that you can be. The sort of Bible teaching that tells you that you can be the glorious you, that you can reach your full potential. Friends, let me tell you that this side of heaven, you will never reach your full potential. You'll never be the glorious you that you want to be. It will come to you one day in heaven, but not this side of heaven as we still deal with sin in our own lives. I don't want to be that to be a real downer on that. I actually want you to press on, okay? Keep doing the hard yards of repentance and faith because you are precious to God. So that's the one thing. Uh, Bible teaching that mimics the modern self-help industry. The other threat uh, really deals with human sexuality today. You know, there are some churches throughout the world who are now trying to find ways to remain relevant uh, to the shifting sexual ethic that we have, you know, we've questioned the nature of marriage, we've questioned the, what, what it means to be male and female, okay? And so churches, in order, to, they're trying to stay relevant to the, all this change and so what they're doing now is they're, they're beginning to question what the Bible actually says about human sexuality, and they're raising arguments such as, you know, what they wrote back then in the Bible was fine for, the, for ancient times, but we're in the 21st century. And so they'll, so they'll question the authority of God's word at that point. I want to say to you that there isn't that much difference between humans in the 1st century and humans in the 21st century. We still struggle with the same things. The third threat, I think, is sort of related to the second, and, and it's what I've been hearing just recently. Uh, there are churches or, or teachers who are dismissing the Apostle Paul's words, saying that his words are less divine because they are not the words of Jesus. You'll see people constantly raising this discussion, saying, Jesus never said this, Jesus never said that. But obviously, the Apostle Paul did say it, but they won't acknowledge his authority as an Apostle of Christ. That is one of the reasons why I hate red-letter versions of the Bible. Why are the words of Jesus in red letters when all Scripture is God-breathed, not just the red letters? That panders to that idea that Jesus' words are more important than his apostles' words. And that is dangerous. That is dangerous for the church. And I think one of the challenges that we're facing in churches today is the emergence of celebrity Christians. People who have no pastoral responsibility to those who hang on to their every word. You know, these celebrity Christians, they're always just one click away on our computers. We can download their talks, we can watch them on YouTube, we can then pass a link on to somebody and say, hey, listen to this guy. And these are people who have no pastoral responsibility for you. Can I encourage you that if you do, and there are terrific speakers out there, but I, I'm, what I'm encouraging you to do is to be cautious to be discerning about those things because they may well be savage wolves. And I say this to you not because I think, oh, you should only ever listen to me or Ez, you know, we're the minister of this church, you know. There's lots of other great, you know, Simon Manchester, I know a lot of people listen to Simon Manchester on Sunday morning before they come here. Uh, you know, Simon's a great guy. He's the minister at North Sydney Anglican Church. You know, there's great guys out there worth listening to. But be cautious, be discerning. The reason I'm telling you this is because you are valued, that you are the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Third point that Paul makes with regards to the ministry is that it depends on God. 
The ministry in the church depends on God. Have a look at verse 32. Paul says, Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance amongst all those who are sanctified. Now I actually think this verse is a bit of a surprise here. I mean, you know, Paul uh, has reminded them of his ministry, how he's modelled to them uh, what it means to serve the Lord, hasn't he? Okay? And then he's instructed these elders that they ought to conduct the ministry in such a way that values the church of God. At this point, I'm sort of expecting Paul to say, guess what, guys, it's all up to you now. The future of the church rests firmly on your shoulders. Go. Go. But that's not what we see here. At this moment in verse 32, we're seeing a significant moment in church history. Here Paul is readying the church for his absence. It is, the church is moving from the apostolic age when the apostles were alive and it's now about to move to the post-apostolic age when no apostles were alive. There's a transition happening here. Paul will never see these guys face to face again. And the church has to figure out how are we going to cope without Paul? How are we going to cope without Paul's wisdom and guidance? How are we going to cope without his authority and his direction? How will they cope with all these overwhelming challenges and responsibilities? And Paul reminds them that the future that is in front of them does not depend on them. Sure, God will use their faithful efforts to serve in such a way that values the church of God, but the underlying reality is that the work, the ministry, is utterly dependent upon God. I mean, this was true even for Paul's own ministry as an apostle. His ministry did not depend on his engaging charisma, the way he could pull a crowd together. His ministry didn't depend upon his brilliant strategies, nor did it depend on his powerful personality. It was a ministry that always relied on God's work of bringing people to repentance and faith, and then God's work in changing people to make them more like Jesus. In fact, Paul even captured this very idea when he wrote to the church in Corinth about the ministry and he said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been uh, been making it grow. And so what Paul does here for the elders is he commits them to God. But he also commits them to the word of God's grace that message of the gospel of God's grace and mercy to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is that word of God's grace that has the power to save people. It is the power of that word that can break down the barriers between Jews and Gentiles in the first century, but break down all sort of racial barriers amongst us now. It is the very word that gathers the flock together. And if they were to have any sort of future as a church in Ephesus, then they needed to remind them, needed to commit themselves to this word of God's grace. Because this would be the ongoing building of the church. It would see them through to the very end where they'll receive their inheritance. I think John Newton sort of captured this truth in a more personal way in the lyrics of Amazing Grace when he said, "'Tis grace has brought me safe thus far." And grace will lead me home. And as the word of God's grace continues to be taught and preached, as it continues to call for repentance and faith to all those who will stop and listen, God will continue to build his church as he sees fit. God can be trusted. God can be relied upon for the future. It has always been that way in the ministry. And because God can be trusted with the future, it frees us up for generosity. To be generous with our time and with our resources and with our money. In fact, Paul modelled this in his own ministry as an apostle as he supplied his own needs. Look at verse 35, it says, So in everything I did, I showed, uh, showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, 
it is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, as we are to think about the ministry, we ought to realise that ministry is always about giving rather than receiving. That as we look to give ourselves to others rather than look for ways that we could, might want to receive acknowledgement for the things that we do. You know, if you do ministry and you want, you're seeking, wanting to seek recognition for what you've done, praise for what you've done. No, it's not, like, it's not about that. It's about giving, not receiving. So how did it go for the church at Ephesus? Here's Paul's last speech to them face to face he sends the uh, Timothy to go and work in that church and we'll be looking at that in 1 Timothy uh, uh, over the next few weeks but how did it go for the church at Ephesus well 35 years later the apostle John recorded Jesus words to the church at Ephesus it's actually recorded as the letter to the Ephesians in in Revelation chapter 2 verses 2 to 6 This is what Jesus had to say to the church at Ephesus. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favour. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. See, in many ways, the church at Ephesus had a lot going for them, didn't it? They have laboured hard. They have served. They have resisted the false teachers that have come their way. But it seems at this point they are muddling through with a a faded fervour for Jesus. They had forsaken the love they first had. And it may well be that the church in Ephesus is simply going through the motions of ministry but they were not written off as a church. The word of God's grace comes to them again. Jesus gives this beloved church a pathway back in verse 5 when he says, consider how far you've fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. There's another chance for this church. And I think it's a reminder that like every single Christian person who is a work in progress, The church is also a work in progress. You see, repentance and faith is the air that we breathe, not only as Christian people, but as a church. And it is my hope and prayer for us as the churches here at St Luke's that we will not forsake our love for Christ and that the ministry of St Luke's will be one that is both sacrificial and sustainable service of the Lord that we will have a ministry that values God's church that has been purchased by his blood and that as we face the future that we will continue to depend on God for the years ahead. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the challenge of your word this morning and what the ministry looks like uh, as Paul spoke to the Ephesian elders. Heavenly Father, we pray for the ministry Uh, here at St Luke's. We pray that it will be one that is ready to serve the Lord, that is both sacrificial and sustainable. We pray that we'll always have ministries here at St Luke's that will value this as your church that has been purchased by your blood. And as we look to the future, as we look past the 200 years that we've already been here on this site, that we will continue to look for your Uh, work amongst us because all ministry depends upon you and we pray these things in Jesus name. Amen.